Thanks, everybody who showed up. Uh, this talk is about uh, the new version of our data processing system, uh, TMD 7.0, and it's entitled Higher Performance Data. Um, I am Chris Nuremberger, if you didn't know. I'm one of three founders of TechAscent in uh, Boulder, Colorado. I worked in computer graphics for many years, and I, my earliest closure repo on GitHub is from 2009 and it was doing computer graphics uh, in Clojure. I have a long history of high-performance computing. I was actually part of a research group in CU trying to uh, optimize simple linear equations by moving them automatically to CUDA. Um, we were, I've worked in GIS systems and weather prediction and large-scale face detection. And I'm the primary author of the data processing system, TMD. Um, so I have a couple other talks. If you like this one, if this type of talk interests you, uh, high performance day with closure and high performance closure. And if you're watching this uh, in a recording and you haven't seen high performance data with closure, I urge you to pause this and go watch high performance day with closure first, because I think it sets the foundation for some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this talk. We're going to talk about some of the things that are in TMD7, some interesting stuff. And I want to talk just shortly about what makes TMD different in functional data science. I want to talk about reduction-oriented programming, so a type of compute model where all you can do is reduce over things. And this will get clear where this mixes in. And it actually goes into some of the escape analysis stuff that we were talking about earlier with regards to GraalVM. And then finally, I'm going to talk about a new tool that I'm really excited about that you know we didn't write, that we found, and it's named DuckDB. Um, we've got a blog post about it, but I want to talk about how it kind of, I want to talk a bit about it, because I think it's a great tool. So overall, uh, in TMD, we fixed uh, over 100 issues between 6 and 7. We got a documentation overhaul. And we got new functionality uh, for conversion of sequences of maps into data sets that goes into reduction-oriented programming that I'm going to talk about. We got a major community-driven API overhaul in the math subsystem. And that I really appreciate that. I can't tell you how much I like other sets of eyes on the API trying to make it more consistent. Because each um, every amount we can get it more consistent, you know, that's less overhead on somebody's brain when they're trying to do other things. And finally, it got lots of optimizations in lots of places and lots of simplifications too. Um, so some of these were driven by research and some of these are just driven by community use cases where people have come onto the TMD dev uh, Zulip and said, hey, here's an interesting way I'm trying to solve this problem. Can you help me solve it better? And a lot of times, not only will we take the time to show different ways you might be able to solve the problem, but those will end up in the unit tests because sometimes those are just really interesting problems that I think reflect a broad use case of TMD. So please get on Zulip when you have a big data problem in TMD or you just think you're solving a problem awkwardly, get on, on Zulip and let us chew on it for a second. It's always fun for me to see how people are using the software. So um, TMD7 got a new parsing pathway for parsing maps. And this is like, I think the the primary way a lot of people are interacting with TMD is they're producing sequences of maps and then they're doing some operations in TMD and they're going in between sequences of maps and, and TMD back and forth. But we have a parsing function here that you can create and you can feed it a few maps and then you can essentially call it a different way and get back a data set. And then you can feed it a, f a few more maps and you get back the same data set but with those maps appended to it. And this is all done efficiently. So things are getting resized more than they have to. Um, and we have a transduce compatible version of this pathway. So you can you can transduce your sequence of maps directly into TMD as opposed to producing a sort of sequence-like thing. Um, this gets into reduction-oriented programming, but um, I think this is a, just a cool way to interact with uh, bringing data into TMD. And it was developed by a um, an IoT app, essentially named VeloBot, where um, our uh, Calder, who's here on the phone, is developing uh, a combined CLJ React Native, CLJS React Native app. And he's getting a lot of data from the sensors on a phone. And he's taking that data and he's efficiently creating data sets out of it and then communicating them back. Um, I really like this 
style of development, this showed like the full vision of everything working together. You know, we have React Native, we have an iPhone app, we're getting data efficiently from a bunch of sensors, we're, we're transforming that efficiently into data sets. Uh, the CLJS version of uh, TMD uses typed arrays under the covers. So all that data is stored like very efficiently and is efficient to operate on. And we also have a good way of sending the data back to the mothership, back to the server to operate on it. And so this this was kind of what I had in mind when I wrote TMDJS was some sort of like IoT like application on a on a, a low power environment that then you would efficiently be able to do some computations on, but also send data back, you know, to to store it and to process it, it with more horsepower available. Um, so if you like to ride, if you're a serious road biker or even a semi serious road biker, check out Velobot. Uh, you know, it's a it's a great app, and I think that you're going to like some of the stuff you put in there. Um, another thing that we did in TMD 7.0 is an API overhaul of D-Type Next. That's what we were talking about, the community-driven thing. D-Type Next has a namespace in it, um, uh, tech v3.datatype.functional. And this namespace has all the sort of what I call vectorized operators just basically a version of plus that can take one thing but or it can it can take a scalar or it can take a scalar and a vector and if it gets a scalar and a vector it'll broadcast the scalar so that it works the way it would in pandas or lots of other things or in sorry in numpy or lots of other things but anyway there is a lot of naming issues there are a lot of inconsistencies of variable names there are times when a variable was first and it should have been last you get the idea it just really helps to have other eyes on this and I want to thank, you know, Daniel Slutsky. I've said this before, he's really done a lot of work making these systems nice and introducing new, new people to these systems. So he took the lead on that. Um, so let's talk about a little bit. For those of you who aren't using TMD every day, maybe somebody who's catching this on an internet on the internet and doesn't use uh, TechML data set at all, let's talk a little bit about what makes TMD different. And it definitely starts at um, functional data science using Clojure's notions of persistence. But on a more like concrete term, it has to do with how dynamic TMD is in comparison to a lot of the other sort of high-speed um, data processing systems. So this is, a, this is a great example from Python where we have a data frame and we assign it to a new variable. We start operating with the new variable. And then of course it changes the original data frame. We uh, we joke that with when you're dealing with pandas, you're either wrong or you're using too much memory, and you can't really know which, so you have to try them both. <laughs> and so very often, you know, you'll subtly change something upstream of you and not realize it, and then that variable will appear, you know, later in your notebook or later in code or you know, lots of different places. So this is the same story with mutability. Um, it's kind of like a data frame being mutable is a is like the most, it's like a data, it's like working with um, a database with the old school databases with full mutability where you just you just really, it's hard to know if you've changed something earlier in your notebook or not in some way that'll make it break. Um, in TMD, the same code path doing the same thing, of course, doesn't mutate the variable earlier and on really big data frames, this will run at the same speed the pandas does. And in general in TMD, you know, it's it performs well. We'll talk about that later, but it performs fine. And it's much safer to use than I think pandas or um, ours data frames or Julia's data frames or anybody's who doesn't really have persistence and immutability baked into the core API. Um, and so that was the first thing. The first thing that makes TMD different is it's functional all the way. Um, it's a very functional system. So it, it you do not change variables um, that you've already assigned. You, you can go back in time to speak. The other thing that makes it different, and this is really leveraging what makes uh, the JVM different, is that um, the, the data storage or the data access system backing a column is um, completely abstract. So there, the column is sitting on a completely abstract interface and it's mixing a completely abstract random access interface, which I've talked about in several different talks with, you know, a missing set to produce a column and a, 
a data set's really just a map of columns. Um, it's kind of a dual system, but it's mostly a map of columns. But um, this has, I would not have done this in C++. And the reason is that per element access is virtualized through two kind of virtual interfaces, the columns and the buffers. And you, you just would avoid virtualizing a low level element wise access of your data in C++. But on the JVM with Hotspot, we find that especially in tight loops, we don't pay the cost for that virtualization like we would in a C++ system. And this is one thing, this is the magic of dynamic. This is where we can build very simple code paths dynamically uh, late after the system has been, you know, at runtime or even at REPL time, which is like while the program's running and have Hotspot just dynamically optimize those kernels into something that performs really well. And that is just such a unique property. No other data frame has that. No other data frame has hotspot. And so there's things that the other, other data frames will do better because they've been optimized and hard coded to do specifically that thing. But we can get away with really dynamic behavior and have it really perform pretty well. And that has important uh, implications in how complex your systems are at the end of the day. So this is just a small example. I think it's probably small enough that um, it might be higher on your eyes, but basically we complete we 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 create a completely abstract reader via Reify, and a column is just a reader plus a missing set, and then we can create a data set uh, from a sequence of columns. That data set will perform the same as if we have you know a Java array as the data behind the column, or if we have a native memory buffer typed as a float, you know, a float store as the backing behind the column. Um, but we can just easily create these like totally dynamic columns out of thin air. And that is not a property that you find across all data frames. So that is the second differentiator is we've really tried to leverage the dynamic capabilities of the JVM while still respecting efficiencies and not being overly dynamic when we don't need to be. And so um, this is, you know, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about a compute model that we developed while researching ham fisted. And for some of you, I think if you got a long way into transducers in 2014 or 15, then this is probably old hat, some of this. But for most of you, I think this is this is different, you know. Um, the initial focus of DType Next, which is the library that underlies TMD, was simply accessing JVM heat buffers and native buffers in a uniform way. Um, it, it, and honestly, it amazes me that it's 2023 and Java's been around so long, and they've been so bad with native interfaces for so long. You know, Java didn't have a good FFI story. Uh, JNI is not a good FFI story foreign function interface. Java didn't have a great way of calling C from Java. It's it's acted like, you know, native memory was the root of all evils. And um, you know, pure Java was a thing. And I think that hurt Java in the long run. I honestly do. But that's a different conversation for a different time. Um, but aside from that, the initial focus was on these random access arrays of buffers essentially. And so I did everything through indexing like get element at position y but instead i've i've learned over time it's better to just ask the buffer to reduce to, to call reduce on the buffer than to call random access um into the buffer for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about later but overall i focused on making sure on every single data structure of which there are very many in tmd and d type next they have an efficient reduce pathway so from the I mean, literally turtles all the way down from ham fisted to what's actually like low level Java all the way up. We've really focused on making sure that everything supports the um, two arg version of reduce. Uh, the one arg version of reduce, I'm not a huge fan of, but the two arg one, the one that takes an initial value, we've focused on that. Um, so uh, then. When parsing data, we were often iteration based. I was iterating through maps um, and finding that um, creating a purely virtual iterable interface is pretty hairy, but creating a purely virtual I reduce 
reduce interface is not very hairy. And we are going to look at an example of that. And that goes to like, we're basically making everything work well with reduce. You know, columns implement reduce by first checking if there's any missing values. And if there's not, they just pass reduce to the buffer. We've already talked about the buffers implement reduce efficiently. So in this way, we get like some pretty simple optimizations where we're not checking a missing set every value. And then uh, um, in, in just in general enclosure, transduce bay pipelines, which are you know lazy non-caching pipelines work better if your your destination if your containers support reduce of course because transduce is reduce based. So this is an example concretely of what I mean by reduce oriented. Uh, this old pathway kind of manually looped over things and created a sum and returned it. The new pathway create just creates essentially a, a reducer which is a parallelizable version of a reducing function. And it's what, you know, that's the difference in a nutshell of what it looks like in the code a lot of places now, whereas before you were iterating and now you're reducing. Um, so our old parse, our, this is our old pathway of, you know, parsing maps. You can see we're like looking at, here's the map entry and we're getting the key and getting the value and we're doing this and we're doing that. Um, and the new pathway is calling a nested reduction over that sequence. So it's calling reduce over the initial sequence. And then for each item in the sequence, it's calling reduce over that. And it's expecting to get map entries um, or something map entry like. Um, so let's, let's boil this into something a little more specific. A real world use case where we are, uh, this came from our friends at Mastodon and basically start with a table of facility, start date and end date. We want to um, figure out how many days of each month in aggregate are stored at each facility. And then we want to do some general stats on that on top of that. So it's an expansion of the data set into days and then a reduction into year months and then two different aggregations on top of that reduction. This is one that came in from Zulip. This is what I'm talking about, where it, it really helps us if you bring examples of the code you're working with to Zulip and you just uh, put it there. Um, we wrote two algorithms for solving this. You know, one is row major and one is column major. And the benefit of the row major approach is that I think it's how almost everybody thinks to begin with. It doesn't involve kind of hand adding values to containers and it's much more intuitively coded, but it is from a systematic perspective, much more difficult to optimize. Um, the benefit of the column major pathway is that, you know, it's just faster. It's top end performance. Um, it's, it's best possible performance is always going to be better than the row major pathway. Um, both are very parallelizable. And uh, we took time to optimize the uh, row major one quite a bit. And it, because number one, I think it uses a really interesting operator. So I think row mapcat itself is a really neat operator and it has some readability advantages over the uh, column major pathway. Um, so let's talk about, you know, row mapcat where we're gonna take a data set, we're gonna pass a, a function each row and we're expecting to get a sequence of rows back. And in this case, a row is a map and all that TMD7 requires is what's returned is itself reducible and internally each value in that thing, when it's reduced, will look like a map as it's reduced. So <laughs> I think we're in pretty abstract land here, but um, you can see how the, the version six, yeah, that was helpful. Zooming in on that helped a lot. Version six is, you know, maps and sequences, and I should have used deduction and doing this more, I would have used more deductions and things like that. Um, but it didn't make a difference when I was testing it. And version seven is, is uh, you know, basically turtles all the way down. It's reduce, 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 reduce. I, if you're sick of hearing me say reduce, I'm sorry, we're almost done with this section. And I'll talk about something else in a minute. Um, so, this is a this is the code path for reduce where this version six 
I'm taking the frequency map, which is tally is the frequency map, and I'm uh, copying it essentially, I'm producing essentially a new sequence of records from the sequ frequency map, and those records are then what's passed to TMD. In version seven, um, I really wanna, whoops. In version seven, you can see um, the ham of custom reduce is just reify I reduce in it. It's literally reify closure.lang. I reduce in it. And I'm, I'm returning something that's reducible. And inside my reducible thing, I'm iterating over the map. And I'm, I'm for each value, I'm returning something that is, again, reduces like a map does. And I'm creating virtualized map entries on top of that. So we're not even creating concrete map entries. It's, it's literally virtualized map entries that are created on top of the key and the value of the original map. And my point here was this 7x version is more optimizable by hotspot. It allows hotspots, specifically the escape analysis, to see a lot more of what's going on and to see that pretty much uh, from the very first custom iReduce object, the rest of these are just created as needed during the reduction, which is itself a tight loop. So now we have the magic pattern of where hotspot can see, oh, you're running a couple nested tight loops, and it can start trying to inline each of those nests. And the key kind of thing that helps hotspot work is if there's very, very little concrete code in each thing. And in this case, because everything's virtualized, uh, it ended up being very optimizable by hotspot. And in fact, if you look at the profiler for the, the two of these, you'll see a lot more function calls and noise in the 6x version than you will in the 7x version, because once hotspot inlines things, a lot of that noise just disappears and goes away. Um, so that's an example a specific example of how we've optimized the row map cap operator. And because we've optimized the row map cap operator and because we've optimized the map parsing pathways to be so focused on this one paradigm, we can then push that paradigm out into user code. And now there's a new way to use TMD efficiently. So when you're transforming data into TMD, you don't necessarily need to create a concrete sequence of maps. You can reduce something that reduces like a sequence of maps would, and each thing in it reduces like a map would. Um, I think that's an interesting. And to step back for a second, if we think about the return values of map and filter and map cat, there's a, well, I talked a little bit about this in my last talk about stream-oriented, um, when I was talking about stream-oriented processing models. You could have a reduce-oriented processing model where the return value of filter was only reducible. It wasn't iterable and it wasn't anything else. It was only reducible. And the return value of map wasn't a sequence. It was only something you could reduce. Now this model is um, not extensible to multi-arg map, but thinking about programming in this model, especially for where it does work, I think leads you down a pathway where you produce code that is both very dynamic and very minimal in terms of what the JVM sees and kind of how much work it is for the JVM to make that code disappear at runtime. So it's, I don't know if there's a lot of research on reduce, like specifically reduce oriented processing models, but I do think that that is an interesting um, kind of thing to think about. Like what a filter, was only what if the return value of filter was only reducible and nothing else. So um, let's talk about DuckDB really quick. Um, DuckDB is a new library, newish. I mean, it's three or four years old. And um, I think our first issue we saw about it was 2019. Uh, somebody wrote an issue of saying, hey, have you considered DuckDB? And at that point, it wasn't what it is now. And But we still followed up on it, and we've been watching the project ever since. So whoever gave us that issue, I don't know I don't know the, the person's name, but it really helped us. Because um, this, this, this has been a fun project to watch, and I really like how they, they built the project. So DuckDB is a, a high-performance SQL engine. Um, it stores data in columns. So getting data into DuckDB and out of DuckDB matches TMD's processing model, which is beautiful. 
it auto indexes numeric data, minmax blocks, uh, other places called minmax blocks brand indexes. Um, it obviously processes data in column major chunks. So it goes through your table in column major chunks of data. And it's got a full SQL engine and query analyzer. And, you know, the column major design is faster for various types of OLAP programming. There are specific examples where you want to switch to row major, but they're specific. The general case is column major is faster by a lot sometimes. And then the specific case of, for instance, if I want to sort over multiple columns. So um, if, you know, if X, if column, if you have a sort operator based off both columns X and Y, at that point, it makes more sense to go to row major. And we know this concretely because the DuckDB team have researched this and produced papers on it. So um, they have a paper called, uh, these rows are made for sorting and that's just what we'll do. And if you like nerding out on database stuff, there's actually quite a few papers on DuckDB's website that you can kind of check out and read that are entertaining to me. Um, so DuckDB as a project, just the, 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 the technical details of how they built the project, it's beautiful. Uh, this first line, in process, serverless, C++ 11, no, depend no dependencies, single file build. Like, I, you, you, I don't know how you can go wrong with that. It's just amazing. So it's 100,000 lines of CPP and 50,000 lines of header. It's a very straightforward C API. Um, I found it really easy to work with, although it did force me to implement pass by value for structs and return by value for structs, which I didn't need for Python. Um, you know, it's got four major integration points. We've done two, the italicized integration points we haven't done, but basically batched insert to a table, prepared statements, and then virtualized tables we could implement. You could have a sequence of data sets that looks to DuckDB like a table, and you can have a table to table translation where you get past a data set. You know, you get past a lot of data sets, <laughs> but you're doing a table to table translation. And it's kind of SQLite for the data analytics crowd. I think if you look at the numbers, you find that SQLite is the most used SQL system on the planet by, I think, an order of magnitude. So it runs on every Android phone, it's on every iPhone, it's in every browser, you know, you get the idea. It's not like it's the most powerful one or, you know, these other things, but it is the most used one, it's the most common one, and it is pretty powerful. Well, now we have a nice, powerful, simple database system for data analytics that can handle um, really big data, which was actually a differentiator. In 2019, they weren't handling really big data really well. Uh, in 2023, however, um, it's, it's a different story. Give me a minute. And so it's got really simple bindings. It took 1.5K of, of code, two files, and we dynamically load the shared library. Um, we support zero copy. So speaking of reduce-oriented programming, if you run a query and you reduce over it, one of the options to the query is, hey, during reduce, don't copy the data into the JVM, but put the data set directly on top of the native chunks. And we do support that. In our tests, that did not end, that did not lead to major space savings. So it's not the it, major performance advantages. It's not the default. And you can shoot yourself in the foot with that one for sure, because if you let any part of that data set escape the reducing context, you're obviously, as soon as, as soon as the reduced deduction function is returned, that chunk is released. And if you're still holding on to the data set, the next time you use it, you're going to crash. But um, but as a feature parity with Python, we have zero copy for result sets. Um, and you know we've very carefully designed this API so that you can efficiently reduce or transduce over very big data. And that kind of gets to the big win of, of DuckDB. So this is a little bit about the history of TMD. Um, from the beginning, it was designed to be more or less in-memory data analytics. So one TMD data set is meant to be one chunk of data that fits into your RAM comfortably and that you can process on and whatever else. We don't go through a lot of work effort to minimize the size of it. Aside from storing the data set in native containers, which already gets you a lot over storing it as a sequence of maps, but we don't we don't go much further than that. We could, for instance, run length and code integer columns. Um, there's lots of random tricks you can do, but 
we don't do those things. It's meant for high speed memory to memory applications. Um, I always expected at some point to extend TMD to handle larger than memory data sets. So to handle, you know, terabyte sized data sets. Um, but I, uh, I knew that would be a lot of work and I didn't want to do it just arbitrarily on a few data sets that I saw that I could kind of work around other ways. Um, however, now that DuckDB is around, uh, and I know that we have good systems for getting data in and out of DuckDB, I'm not, I think that is the answer for big data processing in TMD. I think when you're dealing with spark level data, when you're dealing with terabyte or petabyte data, I think that leveraging, um, DuckDB really effectively dramatically increases your reach in Clojure as to the type of data that you can efficiently handle without needing to jump into Hadoop and Spark, which essentially require their own kind of IT department to run. Um, so, so in TMD, um, looking towards the future, I think the performance is good enough. I don't see in TMD 8, Unless you're, it's a specific algorithm and a specific thing that we maybe didn't optimize that well, I don't see eight having a lot of oomph that seven doesn't have. We've already gone through the nuts and bolts and down to exactly the bytecode that's running to make seven as nice as it can be. Um, I think that people are going to be using TMD on bigger data sets, and I think we've we, with with DuckDB, I think we've given we now have a really nice tool for extending that use case. Um, we're seeing more and more Clojure teams adopt TMD. If you look at the Clojure downloads rate, it is, it is, the number is consistently growing. We're seeing more and more people hit the API docs. So I know that it's getting usage because nobody's going to spend time on our API docs, reading API docs, unless they're using the tool. Um, on a nice bit, one thing I want to talk about for sure is we're seeing more and more experienced Python and R people come across and use TMD and say, hey, I wasn't sure I could use Clojure for my stuff, but thanks to TMD, we can switch to Clojure and we, you know, I'm all my data processing pathways uh, are working and they're performing fine. And so that is huge because moving someone from Pandas to TMD, I just think we're really making your life easier. Um, I think you'll have fewer errors. I think that you will uh, find working in your notebooks or working in your data processing systems more enjoyable. Um, yeah, I think it's just a cleaner system in general. And sure, there's edge cases that we don't do as well, but but by and large, you'll have fewer problems and you can spend time on the edge cases at that point. Um, same with R, although with R, especially with Deployer, I have I have fewer things negative to say. Um, we've learned a lot from R and Deployer and specifically Tablecloth has really helped bring over people from R into an environment where they're used to R's kind of very high level API, um, specific deployers, very high level API. Um, as I said, with DuckDB, I think we have a great start, spark, start for a true Spark alternative. So in organizations that are maybe thinking of moving to Spark, I would urge you to try uh, distributing your data and using DuckDB on it and with, in, conjunction with TMD for the, the custom stuff that you don't want to describe in SQL. Um, I was on Slack earlier this week. Uh, of course, somebody was doing something and they wanted a shuffle that took a uh, kernel uh, seed and that exists in TMD and in the low level, level data structures library um, ham-fisted. And he, I, I said like, look, this is there's a very efficient way to use shuffle if you're going to call it repeatedly. And his response was, well, all of our time is spent in Spark UL anyway, so 5% is the runtime and it's fine, which is great. Um, but uh, I think for those types of people, I urge you to consider uh, using DuckDB. Um, for those types of systems, I will tell you that DuckDB can load Parquet and CSV files and such over S3. So if you have your data set already set up in S3, might as well give DuckDB a try. Um, and then uh, I think that there's a solid progression from pure closure to TMD, to TMD and DuckDB. And I think that gets you a nice progression between increasingly powerful systems as your data set size increases. Um, I'm a big fan of progressions. I think very often in software, people skip steps in their progression and then they plateau out in places where they should not. So um, I would say 
specifically uh, Spark skipped the single machine kind of like simple use cases. And it skipped them because it was a bunch of developers at, Cer at CERN who needed to solve the biggest data problem probably mankind's ever created, which those super colliders produce just enormous amounts of data. Um, and so they're, they just wanted a system that would scale infinitely from day zero. And that's fine, but you skip the step of like the average case of somebody working on a laptop. And I think that it makes more sense to optimize the laptop case first, the single machine, single CPU case first, and then move up to multiple machines once you have that first case optimized, because it, the, the need to move to multiple machines is greatly reduced, obviously, when you have the first um, machine uh, case, use case optimized well. And so an analogy, you know, is in a, a fun analogy I can give you in the physical world is muscle ups in gymnastics. And so I don't know how many of you are gymnastics people or ever tried to do a muscle up, but they're a movement where the bar starts above your head and with your hands, you pull the bar down to your hips. And that requires you to move your shoulders like through a rotation that's really tough and takes a long time to learn. And the uh, the CrossFit people looked at the muscle ups and we'll said, well, well, we'll do what's called kipping, which is in the, the hardest part of the muscle up, which is that rotation from above your shoulders to below your shoulders with the with the rings, they'll kip and they'll use their whole body to, to kind of jump up above the rings. And uh, I read a book by uh, a man named uh, Coach Summers, who is I think a US Olympian gymnastics coach. And he said, the problem with kipping is that you fail to build the muscles you will need for later points in the progression. So if you want to move from a muscle up to an iron cross and you've been kipping your muscle ups, you will fail to do it. And I, this is very true in software too. Um, oftentimes we reach for a goal and we skip steps in the progression and then we'll plateau earlier than perhaps we should. Um, and so uh, there's more I could say about that. Um, but uh, that's my talk for now. Um, I want to say thank you. This is the emails you can reach us all at. Uh, you can find me on Zulip. You can find me on Slack. And uh, this is my obligatory aster picture. We were successful in growing wine caps in the garden this year, and he was delighted to find, you know, two giant wine cap mushrooms. So another talk, if you want to hear something else I'm passionate about, I like um, kind of regenerative farming and, and soil ecologies and so if you want me to talk about for instance the uh <laughs> the commonalities between the metacircular interpreter and the carbon cycles that was another talk i was thinking about giving but that'll be a talk for another day anyway so let's open up the floor to questions we still have a lot of time left um so yeah let's get a discussion going i want to hear what everybody thinks